this is our, our the last day of our forum. Uh, we hope you had a pleasant evening yesterday. We will start with some information about the, the program. We will uh, have some, if we have in, in MDCEP program, we have the quality management system. And then we will have some important information that Hiromi will provide us. And then REC will provide us some information about the AO acceptance crit criteria and then the future state of the program. After it, we will have some presentations by the auditing organizations and the industry. So please, uh, Hiromi Kumada from PMDA uh, QMS. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hiromi Kumada from PMDA. I'm QMS representative for MD sub QMS. Kimberly Ransky Walker from FDA is there. <laughs> is FDA's MD sub QMS management representative. She is maintaining MD sub website, including uploading the latest version of the MD sub documents and the information. We would like to talk about quality management system for the operation of MD sub. I'd like to explain why MD sub QMS has established. MD sub QMS has been developed to assist MD sub regulatory authorities in consistently conforming with MD sub procedures and policies and to demonstrate to internal ex external parties that MD sub is an effective international program for the recognition of third party auditing organizations to have the ability to consist we audit medical device manufacturers for regulatory purposes. When you see the MD sub document page under the MD sub website, you can find mainly four kinds of documents. First, three policies. Policies are high level documents such as statement or corporation, P03, MD sub laws and responsibilities. P03 defines the criteria for MD sub membership. Secondary audit procedures. Audit procedures defines how MD sub auditing organizations conduct MD sub audits. AUP02 MD sub audit approach is the guidance document for MD sub auditors to perform MD sub audits. AUP08 audit determines that addresses how to calculate audit time under the MD sub. We have AUP 19, which defines the content of audit report, and P 26, which is a, which is a procedure of MD sub certificate. AUP 27, post audit activities and timeline policy, specif specify the timeline to complete post audit activities and to share audit information with regulatory authorities. AUP 37, guidelines on the use of GHTF N19 for MD sub purposes, addresses how to light non conformity and grain non conformity. Based on these documents, the MD sub auditing organizations can perform MD sub audits consistently and reliably. Thirdly, assessment procedures. We regulatory authorities conduct assessments of errors according to the procedures as shown in this slide. ASP 12 is a procedure for conducting witness audit. ASP 16 is a procedure for AOS office assessment. ASP 34 is a guidance document for regulatory authorities assessors to conduct AOS assessment. Last three QMS procedures. Here's a list of our quality management system procedures. We have QMS manual, document control procedure, management review procedure, internal audit procedure, CAPA procedure, and so on. This brings to the end of the presentation. We continuously work on improving our QMS to demonstrate that MD SARF is effective and reliable international program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hiromi. Uh, now I would, would like to invite uh, Kenishi Shibashi 
So Kenichi is our uh, RAC member. So he is now the chair of the RAC. He will provide us some information about the AO acceptance criteria and the future state of the program. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kenichi Shibashi. Uh, today um, I'm going to talk state of the program which includes future activities of MD SAP under um, AO, uh, new AO acceptance criteria. And uh, thank you everyone for your participation to the forum. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Colleagues, for hosting this whole forum. So um, this is the history of MD SAP. The activities of the program started in 2012 based on the state of mind of cooperation. At the early stages, the main activities were the development of the processes and procedures. After the development, we initiated the AO assessments and the manufacturer audits. These activities were conducted during the pilot phase, and but uh, the participating manufacturers were not so many. The big milestone for us was uh, Canada's transition from community gas to MD SAP. It was January uh, 2019. The number of participating manufacturers went up to nearly 5,000 at the end of the year. So the program entered the actual implementation phase during this period. However, in 2020, COVID-19 pandemic broke out and we were affected by that. We had to focus on dealing with the pandemic at that time. Recently, the situation has changed. Now uh, we are coming back to the normal operation. What uh, we had to do after COVID was the update of the program. We have gained experiences through the operation and we need to update the processes based on it. Besides, for further maturity of the program, we have reviewed the membership and refined the procedure. <clears throat> this is what we did for the audit and assessment updates. Remote audit was initially adopted as a temporary measure during the pandemic, but uh, based on the experience at that time, we started the pilot to consider adopting it as a permanent measure in this March. So AO assessments, uh, as you may understand, we are performing dozens of assessments to the AOs. We have learned that uh, the necessity of managing processes of them. So we are now introducing systematic management processes of AO assessment, utilizing IT technologies and uh, additional human resources. Also, uh, we are exploring, exploring new consideration for the AO candidates. We are currently temporarily suspending the acceptance of the new AOs but in preparation for resuming the acceptance of new AOs, consortium is exploring additional considerations for the new candidates to ensure efficient use of resources when processing of new candidates resumes. Consideration will build on foundational documents such as N3 in order to help 
determine the candidate assessment queue. The intent is to focus future recognition efforts on candidates with the best chances of being recognized. We are currently in the early stages of developing the process. So unfortunately, I cannot discuss the details, but we will provide uh, it in the future forums. In connection with strengthening our organization, we released MDSAP membership recognition criteria in this January. As you know, we have three membership categories, which are affiliate, observer, and the LAC member. In order for a membership escalate to the next level, the member is to demonstrate satisfaction of the criteria. We believe that through the membership escalation rule, we can make our program to open and uh, transparent. These are the activities that we have put our efforts on in 2023 to enhance credibility and stability of the program. Next, I would like to introduce our most recent efforts, which is performance enhancement. We have the audit processes established, and uh, also we have the AO assessment processes established. Meanwhile, the expectation to the program appears growing. The idea of regulatory reliance was initially developed in around 2018, and recently regulatory harmonization schemes such as ICH, ICMLA, and even IMDLF are promoting it. So as the results, some countries de deploying the reliance mechanism. Also, industries are showing their expectation to the arrays using the outcome of MDSAP. Since we believe that the program has potential to more widely used, we are discussing the way to enhance our performance. The aim of the enhancement is listed here, creation of more transparency about MDSAP performance, demonstration of benefits and the value of MDSAP participation, communication of the effectiveness, continuous improvement, and the efficiency of the MDSAP, highlight the maturity and trust of the MDSAP in its operation, and the partnership approach between the RAC, SMEs, and the AOs to deliver and report on the performance of the MDSAP. In order to make, take measures to further strengthen the program in a comprehensive manner, we initiated this activity. So the elements of the performance enhancement includes capacity increase of the regulatory authorities and auditing organizations, systematic performance monitoring, implement of the timeliness of the audits, and the AO assessments, enhancement of qualities, including audit report quality, systematic rapid identification of the issues and the resolution of it, periodical performance reporting, and the increased engagement of the stakeholders. The proposed enabling levelers so far are listed here. These are just 
the examples, but uh, we have many other plans for the performance enhancement. Next steps, uh, since we need to take further steps to crystallize these activities, uh, we cannot show you the detail yet, but we will be able to provide you more information of this, these activities soon. So please look forward to it. So lastly, uh, I'd like to announce the chair country transition. Like as a international frameworks, MD SAP regularly rotates its chair. After the US, Brazil, and Canada, Japan is now taking the chair country and from the next year, TGL will be the chair country. The MDSAP performance enhancement activities that I introduced earlier will continue under the strong leadership of TGL. So we work hard for the improvement of the program, hearing the feedback of stakeholders continuously. So uh, thanks everyone. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Kenichi. So uh, before we open for questions, I have three questions here we received yesterday. Maybe we can uh, answer them now as I think it's more related to the RAC activities. First, first question is um, from we received from the regulatory authority from Egypt. They asked for MDCEP membership as Egyptian Drug Authority has recently joined the IMDRF as an affiliate member. Does this help in joining MDCEP membership? So uh, participation of the IMDRF as an affiliate aid member uh, is uh, shows uh, to some extent uh, the maturity of the regulatory authorities. So um, this is just an element, could be just an element, but it uh, could help uh, in joining uh, MDSAP membership as an affiliate to some extent. Uh, thank you, Kenichi. I also received uh, two more questions here. Um, I think you already answered them, but just to make sure, the question is first, when will it be possible for new auditing organizations to submit their application to join the program? And the second one, is it possible for new auditing organization to submit their application in the, or the pro program is still closed for the moment? So uh, we are now uh, suspending the uh, acceptance of the new AO application, but uh, uh, we are developing the processes of accepting the AOs. So when now we are working it, but uh, soon after we establish the processes, we will announce through the website. So uh, I cannot clarify the timing uh, yet at this time, but it will be announced on the website. Thank you, Kenichi. Uh, any more questions for Hiromi or Kenichi?
Okay, we can proceed for the next presentations. It will be a presentation from the MDCEP auditing organizations, uh, how to validate MDCEP certificates. So I think this presentation will be very helpful for the arrays and even for the the society to how to it will be easier to understand about MDCEP certificates. Thank you. Go ahead down. Thank you, Tiago. Um, so just to explain, this is um, will incorporate all auditing organization information, even though this is TOSA branded. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so to start, there are really three main methods of all the auditing organizations of how you can validate the validity of a certificate. It's either through websites, QR codes, or email requests to the auditing organizations. Um, I know it's a little bit hard to read here, but I have included um, a list of all the auditing organizations and the ways for each one that it can be validated. So it differs from auditing organization to auditing organization. If there is a website link that can be used, we've embedded it in this presentation. So if this is provided, um, you can just click on that link and it will take you to the website where you can um, enter in information to try and validate that certificate. And then it also includes if a auditing organization uses a QR code on their certificate or not and how that can be used as well. I wanted to note here as well, um, I apologize information for TOVS USA is missing, but in the final presentation, if, it's, if this is provided, we will make sure that information is there. I'm using um, a TOVSUD certificate as an example, but again, this in, involves um, features that many of the auditing organizations use. So um, for example, here is the QR code that might be placed on the certificate itself by an auditing organization. So in this example from TOVSUD, if you were to um, Put your camera on that it will take you directly to our website and it will pull up the information for this specific manufacturer um, if you clicked on that information on the website it will provide you more details about the certification body if the certificate is valid or not and scope information um, some are, I mean, organizations, the certificate is digital and, and there are safety features on those digital certificates. Um, one of them, again, that might be used by a auditing organization is the signature at the top. Um, and I will provide a little bit more information about that. Again, some auditing organizations also in their digital certificates have hyperlinks within the certificate, again, that you can click on and will take you once more directly to their website. So in case you might not have the website um, handy, some of the certificates include it and you can click on that and once again will bring you to the place where you can search by potentially the manufacturer's name, the certificate number if you might know it. And lastly, just a little bit more information on the digital signatures that some of us might have. Um, a lot of them are um, traceable to the legal entities. They've been um, accepted or registered with different geographic locations, such as the EU or uh, the uh, other areas. Um, and a lot of times those digital signatures will lock the certificate from any sort of modification. So in the case of exa an example of TOVSUD, you aren't able to even copy, highlight or copy or any information on that certificate. So it, it's, it's locked down that you can't um, do any modifications of it. That's really what we have for how to validate our certificates but if there's questions or thank you don uh any questions for don about the certificates 
So um, maybe this is a question for Don or any of the AOs. Have you did you see any sort of uptick in fraudulent certificates mainly during the pandemic? Um, I know that at FDA I worked the emergency use authorization um, email box and uh, that we had a considerable number of fraudulent certificates of various sorts being submitted to us as um, evidence to you know expedite their EUA process. I just wondered if you had seen an uptick in that uh, recently or during the pandemic in particular. Um, speaking for Tosud, when it came to our MD SAP certificates, we did not. Um, I don't know about our notified body, however, so I don't know if any other AO has any experience or wanted to answer that. Uh, we had two cases, but not MD sub. Uh, also, as uh, IMQ, we had some cases, but not for MD sub as well. For uh, NSAI, we had a couple of cases, but not for MD sub. For TUV USA, if not, we had a number of requests confirming if the MD SAP certificate was an authentic one, but not a fraudulent certificate. Yeah, for BSI, we haven't seen any fraudulent certificates for MD SAP, but we have had a couple for 1345. Yes, to Freeland also. So we got a couple of cases uh, for MDD, IVD but not MDSAP. And for SGS or MDSAP? I have a question. So if any of the AOs or the jurisdiction that uh, discovers a fraudulent cert, do, is there a database or somewhere that you can share the information with the rest of us? Sorry. Yeah, so at the presentation, we just shared an Excel file. I think maybe it could be an action item that uh, be shared with the affiliate members so they can see for every AO how to verify the certificate. Correct? Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, we will share. Of course, we will share this, the presentations, but I think also uh, the question was more related. If we face with a false certificate, if you have any database or any, any place that we can be aware that this certificate is is being provided for the arrays or for anyone in the in the uh, medical uh, device environment. So the question: How to report it to us? Now, if the, if the audit, I, I under, can you repeat the question? But I understood that if they can't provide information for us that they have face with a false certificate, is it correct? Yeah, so I was wondering if there's such database so that when we do our environmental scanning, we can pick up these kind of signals and then fit to our, our, our organization. So normally it happens, somebody is verifying a certificate. And you are asking if we identify such a case, you want it to be shared with the RAs and the affiliates? Okay. I think there'd have to be some definition. I mean, again, the verification of certificates, it's it's a something of a spectrum, right? So there could be certificates provided which are valid but have been withdrawn, for instance. And so the question is, you know, is that a fraudulent certificate because it is being presented as evidence of certification, even though you're uncertified, or is a fraudulent certificate that which by definition wasn't issued by the AO. So I think we would be have to be careful about where along that spectrum, you know, we are, because obviously these are our clients and 
you know, some some things are done simply by mistake more than often uh, than than not. So I, I, we would need to be very uh, precise about what the definition of fraud would be, I think. Um, I was going to add to I know Tubsud has what we call a blacklist on our website, and it is a list of um, companies that have misused our marks or certifications that um, are no longer able to do business with us or so we do have such a list. Um, if you if you Google on our website or search our website, it's it's called the blacklist. Thank you, Don. Uh, any more questions? Go ahead, Bradley. So just in case if any of the AOs found out that there was a fraudulent certificate, do we need to report back to the MDSAP consortium saying that this is what we found out and we need to share it among the group? Uh, we would appreciate to receive this information, sure. Thank you. Uh, in Anvisa, we have received a couple of times uh, uh, false MDSAP reports. Uh, we are not using the certificates yet. So when we receive this, we shared with the arrays and with the, only with the auditing organization that supposed to be responsible for the report. But now we we have the pilot project to start to use the certificate soon. Maybe we will have this situation in the future. Um, I guess just one comment I would say is obviously again uh, a lot of our business is based on you know pieces of paper and validation of those pieces of paper so you know this is you know uh, what we do uh, however um, uh, one thing to consider uh, as we're been talking about reps or future reps because of course the certificate itself is not in reps and we already have a central database for all this information and so the more widespread the use of the certificate is again maybe it makes sense for us to also be able to add the certificate uh, to reps so you could validate this stuff directly at any moment that you needed to thanks yeah alex i i think that's a good uh we have to evaluate that as we as we look to build out the, the next system uh, for those things as, as the use of the certificates more widespread. So that's a good point. Go ahead, Bradley. Recently, we have a lot of inquiries or confirmation from Turkey. Egypt and Saudi Arabia related to the MDSAP certificate. Do we have any interest from these regulators to join the MDSAP program? As far as I know, only Egypt, at, at least for Anvisa perspective, we have received some consultations from Egypt. I, I don't know the other race if you have received contact of any of these regulatory authorities. And just to let you know, Egypt, they are participating remotely today.
And just one let one last comment um, that this presentation we we hope it can be very helpful for us uh, as we will start to do our, our pilot project. One of the reasons that we decided to to you to use the certificates is that we have a lot of inquiries for you, the audit organizations. I know you receive many questions and many uh, requests from Anvisa and then if we can get this, these certificates and validate them, I'm sure you will receive less requests from us. So it will be a big benefit for both sides. OK, if no for no more questions, we can proceed for the next presentation. Um, to be the state of medical device audit industry, so uh, down again. Thank you. Just one moment, we need two minutes to pull the presentation. OK, we can start. Thank you. Thank you. So again, this presentation is to talk about the state of the medical device audit industry. It's a perspective from all the auditing organizations. Um, it's split up into three topics. Um, we wanted to start with AI and digitalization as this is becoming a more and more prevalent in our everyday lives. And then, of course, within the um, medical device industry. So as I just stated, um, we're incorporating or seeing incorporation of AI into the medical device industry um, more and more, and also within our own auditing organizations with how we do our work. Um, for example, we're aware that companies have started to design software to augment clinical staff for literature search, as, as an example. Um, auditing organizations are using it to explore how it can help increase efficiency and effectiveness in the tasks that we are performing. 
while at the same time being careful that it doesn't compromise um, or substitute final decisions that we're making. Um, with the increased use of uh, AI, of course, comes expanded or need for new guidance and regulation and also comes with um, additional questions around this, such as how are each uh, uh, regulatory authorities going to be regulating this? Um, questions about harmonization, harmonization between those regulatory agencies. Um, also, will it impact the classification of devices or marketing clearance? Um, and lastly, it also brings up questions about how auditing organizations will actually audit these types of technologies and its use. Um, it also digitalization within our world. Um, it's becoming a greater expectation of our clients that um, we are providing interfaces to them that gives them real time um, information into their certification, um, whether that's uh, where their project, their technical documentation review might be, wh whether their certificate is going to be issued or when. Um, and so we are needing to create platforms and systems that can provide this information. Um, we're also trying to create workflow solutions for our own employees to make um, their jobs easier. And again, providing information to us, whether that's again, technical documentation or audit reports. And then um, we also have heard earlier that even our regulators are increasing digitalization and the use of platforms such as the E-Star. Um, lastly, when it comes to digitalization, we have talked about and seen through the pandemic, we needed to um, change the modality of our audits. And so we went to remote and hybrid auditing. And we have seen that that mode of auditing can be successful. And so now that is also becoming um, an expectation that it's to be used um, and just remote service delivery in general. So again, training of our employees um, using digitalization um, and it can help us with um, the use of our experts and in better ways you can have more audits for example um, instead of having our um, auditors or experts traveling and having that time taken when you're going from um, you know, you might be traveling Monday and Friday and that takes time, whereas if you're doing a remote or hybrid audit, you can um, potentially increase the number of audits that you're performing because you're decreasing the time that it's taking to travel. Um, another item that we wanted to address are some challenges that we're seeing. And we put this kind of two major categories having to do with global harmonization and resources. Um, when it comes to global harmonization, um, sometimes auditing organizations and clients aren't necessarily seeing it at the level that we are hoping or would like or at the speed that we would like. Um, it's difficult sometimes for clients and auditing organizations to um, navigate multiple schemes and it can be burdensome to us. Um, so um, again, like as an example of this is when it comes to hybrid or remote auditing, um, not all accreditations um, treat this the same way or accept um, this mode the same way. Um, and again, an example of this is some schemes might have restrictions on the type of devices or risk class of devices that can be used while others don't. So when we're performing a multiple scheme audit, um, it can be difficult then to use remote or hybrid auditing because not it's not used the same. Um, Brexit and the UKCA also adds an additional layer of complication to the overall situation with manufacturers and auditing organizations. So again, an additional scheme and considerations that we need to um, incorporate. 
Um, auditing organizations are looking, of course, to any aspects and clients, any aspects that can move towards harmonization. So things, whether it's at a QMS level and harmonizing with or aligning with 1345, um, technical documentation, again, IMDRF, the table of contents document and using that on a global level, um, or even when there's some crossover regulations when it comes to specific areas such as cybersecurity, AI again, hazardous materials and items such as that. When it comes to resources, um, some of us are, are kind of tapping out at our um, capacity to hire, and we're also seeing this sometimes in industry. It's as schemes become more complicated um, or the requirements are becoming more extensive, um, we're needing to hire more and more specialized personnel and with more experience and competencies. And um, we're also, again, seeing an increase potentially in the number of mandates of audits, which means those experts' time is being used for longer periods, which means potentially less audits that they can perform. So we need more of those experts. Um, but we're competing then with ourselves and also with industry for those experts. So at times um, resources can become tight. Um, there also can be some difficulties from some AOs um, that might be smaller to meet requirements of the um, competencies for the MDSAT program or even Regionally, um, if you have offices in some smaller geographic locations and auditors that need to meet um, mandate requirements, potentially it can be difficult for some of those regions to meet those mandates. I will say though, while I we've put this here as a challenge, earlier in the week we did have a discussion about N4 with the regulators in ways that um, we can um, work around or find solutions to some of those difficulties. So it is something that we're discussing and, and working on, which is um, a positive. And lastly, of course, when there's challenges, we also wanted to highlight some benefits or highlights of uh, in the industry or, or the program. So while we talked about the challenges of global harmonization, there are also benefits and positives as well when it comes to global harmonization. So part of that is seeing the use and acceptance of the MDSAP reports by many countries that aren't currently um, affiliates or officially part of the program. Um, and we also are very happy to hear that um, every year that there are more and new affiliates as part of the program and that they're working towards um, the pathway and moving along the pathway to becoming full members. Um, and again, as Kenichi had just mentioned, the regulators have worked on that pathway. So uh, once again, we're happy to hear that there's a pathway to allow people to become full members while at the same time ensuring that it's not going to become overly burdensome for our clients or even the auditing organizations. Um, we also are very happy to hear that MHRA is, has expressed interest and in the intention to use the program and we're looking forward to that. We're also seeing an increased interest in the program um, within industry, so we're seeing steady interest. Um, clients and manufacturers are um, very interested and attracted to the idea of the single audit, um, and a lot of them are using that into the medical device realm um, and certification and marketing clearance. Um, Joining you know, that market and the capabilities are important um, to our clients. Um, and we're also, there have been discussions um, about potentially expanding the program to outside of the current definition of a manufacturer under the program. So potentially allowing um, 
contract manufacturers as an example of a type of organization. So we also are looking forward to if that will potentially be um, able to happen and again, allowing more people to participate. And lastly, the maturity and stability of the program. So as, as time has gone on, the major roadblocks and confusions that our clients and even auditing organizations themselves have had are being resolved. And as we audit, our auditors are in, and, and our clients are becoming more familiar with the process. Audits are running smoother now because everybody kind of understands what to expect during these audits. Um, and now the focus really more is on the refinement and harmonization of what all the auditing organizations are doing and ensuring that we're providing consistent and reliable information um, both to our clients and to the regulators so that they can utilize um, what we're, we are doing for them. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dawn. So, any questions for Dawn? Nada, go ahead. Thank you for, for this presentation. Um, I'm not entirely sure if it's it's a question to Don specifically, but if you can answer, that would be great. Um, I'm, I was interested in hearing about the potential expansion to contract manufacturers and if this was in relation to decisions that have taken place in the MDSAP in terms of guidance uh, in itself or where this expansion is coming from. Um, uh, it just made me think because also you, <laughs> earlier in the slides uh, we heard that resources are stretched, so expanding further would be difficult. Uh, I don't know if you if you have an idea of how you're going to be balancing that. So two questions. Thank you. Sorry, I missed your second question, but um, the expansion of the program to contract manufacturers uh, would benefit uh, some of the full members uh, more than others. Um, we have discussed internally what that would look like. Um, we need to discuss further and, uh, you know, just kind of get more data on it. Uh, look at how we're performing. We're trying to improve certain parts of, of MDSAP before we can make decisions on expansion. So that's what we're really trying to do. But um, it would be beneficial for the U.S. for sure. But um, we have to make this decision together. Speaking for, as an AO, we do get requests from some of our larger multi-site um, organizations that their contract manufacturers uh, or their contract manufacturing sites be included. Um, it helps them with their QMS and the consistency that they they review their their sites. Sure, I think we've received some feedback also, Pam, from um, large manufacturers as well, which is. Um, why we've had some discussions internally about this. Uh, just one comment. Uh, also, uh, on Visa's perspective, to include uh, con contracted manufacturers, we will also benefic be beneficial for Anvisa. Um, when one of the action items we have in, in this forum is to revisit the eligibility criteria for MDSAP. So for sure, this is a topic that we will discuss in the near future. But at the same time, we have concerns about the resources. In, in many of the assessments that we have participated and we, we see some kind of uh, delays to, to finish audit activities, for example, the problem is lack of resources. And then if we expand the program, it can be, uh, we can have a worse situation considering the resources that we have available at the moment.
Any more questions or comments for this topic? So we are a little bit ahead in the schedule. My proposal is to, before the break, we start with one of the presentations of the medical device audit of the medical device industry. Uh, we have the presentation from Paula, uh, the Brazilian industry. Is, is it okay, Paula, for you? Yeah. Okay. So next presentation, please. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Paula Bresciani. I am here representing Abimed. Uh, can you speak a little bit closer? Uh, th thank you. Is that better? All right. I'm Paula Bresciani. I'm here to uh, report on the MDSAP industry experience for the Brazilian market. And I am, <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not experienced with this microphones. Uh, all right, so um, I am uh, representing Abimed. Abimed is one of the Brazilian industry associations and representing six, about 65% of the uh, Brazilian medical device uh, market uh, with importers, manufacturers and uh, companies that uh, provide medical devices in Brazil. The healthcare sector is very representative for our economy and is responsible for several uh, direct and indirect uh, employ, uh, employees. And um, the purpose of ABIMED is to uh, contribute with the medical device sector, uh, expanding the access of the Brazilian population to advanced health technologies, aiming to improve people's quality of life, life and longevity. And they do that by uh, engaging with several stakeholders, such as government, ministries, uh, health departments in all the spheres of our federation, also engaging with academy and uh, national and international uh, research institutes. And uh, our, the object of our uh, conversation here today engaging with regulatory entities, not only with Anvisa, but also with uh, ANS uh, that regulate uh, medical uh, healthcare uh, sector, uh, in Metro, Anatel, and other uh, companies that, inter that have an interface with uh, the medical devices industry. Abimed currently has around 200 member companies. Talking a little bit about the sector, uh, about 70% of the medical devices licensed at Anvisa today are imported. It's a characteristic of our market, uh, but regardless of the origin of the medical devices, all of the companies that have uh, licenses that hold registrations within Anvisa are legally established in Brazil, uh, whether or not their branches, their manufacturer, they're imported, they are all legally established in Brazil. Uh, and the Brazilian market imported uh, 1.2, 1.32 billion uh, dollars in 2022, and exported 325 million dollars, uh, especially for those markets here in the presentation. Uh, we have a big uh, park of manufacturing, uh, about 4,500 manufacturers in our uh, country. And yesterday we learned that only 30 companies are MDSAP uh, certified uh, as manufactured in Brazil. And that is one of the opportunities that we have to even expand the MDSAP participation into the country. Um, I brought this, I don't want to preach to the preachers, but when I uh, collected feedback from the associates of uh, Abimed on how they experience, uh, what was their experience with the program, 
uh, and, and started to prepare my presentation, one of the things that I reflected was, was where do we want to be? So I brought this here because that's our North Star and that's uh, uh, that's the goal that's established in the statement of cooperation uh, between the member uh, the member uh, countries. And uh, we feel that we are evolving towards this goal even more and more each year. And we are in a big process to mature and to implement all of these, uh, these objectives. Uh, my presentation is structured in uh, how the, the companies that are going through the process feel. Uh, the, the interfaces with the uh, stakeholders, the auditing organizations, the authorities that uh, are related to the process. But uh, due to the characteristics of our market, uh, we are more integrated with some specific steps of this process. So uh, regarding the pre-audit processes, uh, we feel from uh, the uh, perspective here in the industry is that uh, it's uh, very beneficial that we have a single reference document that covers all of the jurisdictions. Of course, uh, the regulations that are covered in these documents, they were already implemented uh, originally by principle uh, by the participants because they were already regulations uh, that these companies had to comply with. But having them all into a single reference uh, document helps uh, the, the, the companies to um, integrate and optimize their processes and how they uh, implement their quality system. About uh, the potential to reduce the number of audits, it's something that we have already observed. Uh, it is in indeed integrated and we have uh, observed the, the reduction into the, the number of audits, uh, but uh, some uh, individual member jurisdiction audits are still happening to certified uh, uh, manufacturers covering uh, QMS elements that were already under the MDSAP scope. So uh, we have, uh, from the discussions that we, we've we seen yesterday, we see that this is already in the agenda and there is water dripping on me. Also, <laughs> gonna move over a little bit. Um, but um, that's something that we believe it's an opportunity for us to, to discuss. Uh, it also improves access to international markets beyond the members of the program. It's a very uh, accepted quality seal, and it's how it helps open door. Uh, it helps open doors uh, with other markets as well. About the audit process, we uh, understand that the auditing organizations are generally consistent in covering the audit approach. There has been some punctual uh, discussion, but generally speaking, they are uh, consistent. Uh, the auditors are also generally well prepared and we are, have already observed the challenge uh, with increasing lead times for the certification uh, based on auditor availability and we have already touched this as well so it's interesting that it's all coming together uh, with uh, similar uh, perceptions of the program. Uh, regarding the contents of the MDSAP audit approach document, uh, we understand that it successfully covers local requirements, uh, but we uh, want to highlight the criticality of uh, the document to be co uh, correct and up to date, as well as training to be provided to the auditing organization and to the auditors. This needs to be, uh, these, these messages need to be convened to the front line because some of the requirements, they date uh, from before the program. So they were written uh, with a context of a local market and not a context to explain to um, foreign markets how uh, to, to implement this uh, specific requirement. So one example that we bring here is uh, the requirements of authorization of functioning. It is uh, required for every Brazilian company to have this authorization by Invisa. And in nowhere in our regulation is written that it does not apply to foreign uh, companies. And this is something that in the beginning of the program, we were 
uh, we we all with support from Anvisa we have to teach. So this happens every time we change a regulation. We are uh, we have a learning curve, and it's very critical that we go through this learning curve together. Uh, uh, both locally, but also within the program and with the frontline uh, organizations that audit our manufacturers. And uh, probably the the main integration we have, main interaction we have with MDSAP as local industry is how it uh, is used as an input to our local regulatory processes. So uh, we have a very positive experience with the uh, implementation of MDSAP. The uh, timelines to obtain an overseas GMP certification have reduced significantly, not only for the uh, for not only for the companies that were audited, but also for non MDSAP plans because it did release resources that are now applied to these co these companies that are known not in the program. Uh, we do see an opportunity to harmonize the definition of which plants are subject to MDSAP certification, which we were just talking about a couple of minutes ago. Um, there are, are they extended to legal manufacturers, to subcontracting? Uh, this is probably one of the uh, points where uh, some of the companies that are required to have a GMP certification by uh, for for uh, the reg registration of their products in Brazil are not necessarily covered by MDSAP. Uh, we also uh, are in line with Anvisa's uh, initiative that was mentioned yesterday to uh, review the uh, cycle of renewal of MDSAP. We understand that this program has uh, demonstrated their uh, competence and their confidence into uh, covering the Brazilian local requirements and therefore uh, they could uh, indeed be uh, considered uh, as, as a source, a reliable source for the GMP certification maintenance. And our last uh, our last topic here it was written before yesterday but uh, we uh, already also had the news of a pilot coming up to uh, ad adopt directly the MDSAP certificate in this recertification process. So it was uh, very interesting to learn about that uh, that proposal from Anvisa yesterday. Uh, we understand that it does cover Brazilian regulations, so the certificate reflects a process that is very robust and very uh, reliable, and uh, that's an opportunity also for simplify and to uh, reduce timelines even further. As final thoughts, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here and we appreciate the openness uh, uh, that we find into discussing the requirements and uh, aligning understanding uh, that uh, when we change regulations and go through uh, the, the audit learning curve, we encourage that this practice is maintained and sustained and we are uh, here to supporting anywhere that uh, it's possible to, to do this. And we would like to close with um, our position that MDSAP is a successful and beneficial program and we see even more potential to increase the participation and develop these benefits even further uh, than we have already observed. Thank you, Paula, for your very informative presentation. We appreciate it. So any questions for Paula? Go ahead, John. Thank you. That's a great presentation. Um, just one uh, question related to sponsors who are located in Brazil. So do you, does your association also have such sponsors who are sponsoring international manufacturers? Yes, we, okay. we have sponsors that are responsible for obtaining the registration of foreign products into Brazil. 
So do you have some feedback from those sponsors? How how they feel about MDSAB audits? Because when we go to audit uh, international manufacturers, sometimes the information that we need to verify about sponsors and sponsor controls, uh, the legal manufacturer, although they should have them, sometimes they need to reach out to the uh, Brazilian sponsor. And based on where these manufacturers are located, it can be a bit difficult. So um, is there any have you felt that kind of a feedback from your sponsors or is there any process to improve that communication between the sponsors and uh, their legal manufacturers? Yes, the, the feedback that we have is mostly regarding the uh, understanding of the local requirements. Uh, that's usually where we are called uh, to clarify any uh, any topics that are not necessarily clear. So uh, that's, that's uh, why we uh, feel that it's critical that the training uh, to the auditors is provided and that clarification is uh, done whenever we change a requirement or we change an understanding of a specific requirement. Other than that, it's it's normal audit process and uh, we provide the information that is required. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, so you have now the MD sub certificate, and I think you said something at the beginning that from attending this forum, you learned how you can maybe use the certificate with other countries, or have you already used it with other regions? It's uh, not being directly used, but it's a door, an open door uh, where we demonstrate quality and uh, robustness of the quality system to regulators that not necessarily are using them officially, but it, it's good. Uh, it, it shows a good uh, adoption of quality system practices. Yeah, it would be interesting to understand maybe later how it's expediting your approval process to new markets or even in the, renewing an existing markets. I, I wouldn't. Uh, Put uh, formal expedition uh, rate. It's more uh, qualitative uh, support on uh, showing that uh, it has a, the manufacturers have a robust quality system. Okay. Any more questions? So if we don't have any more questions, we will do a short break. We will be back on 10.15. Thank you. OK, so now we will have uh, another presentation from, from the industry. So uh, Mia will uh, explain about the Canadian experience of MDSAP. So please, Mia. Okay, good. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank for the thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak about the Canadian experience. Uh, a little bit about my agenda. I'll talk a bit about Meta Canada, uh, our experience, our lessons during COVID, and then we pulled uh, surveyed our members around the benefits, challenges, industry perspectives, and data recommendations, and final thoughts. And I'm so happy. I'm like one of the um, standing me, then someone else, and then it's over. So <laughs> bear with me. Yeah, <laughs> best for last. That's right. I'm not last though. <laughs> okay, we are Meta Canada is a national and not for profit associations. We lead the effort to develop and advance Canada's innovative medical technology industry. And we work closely with federal, provincial, governments, healthcare professional, uh, international associations like DIDA, GMTA, Latin American uh, uh, Convergence, and other uh, associations uh, really to deliver patient-centered, safe, accessible, innovative, sustainable, universal healthcare system. That was a long sentence. 
Um, our vision is for Tana to be a world leader in realizing the benefits of medical technologies, and our mission is to foster a strong, dynamic medical technology sector in Canada for better health outcomes for all Canadians. Um, I'm really not going to go line by line on all this, but it's really the intent is to show you uh, our structure and the really uh, in-depth um, work that we do uh, for our vision and our mission. Um, we uh, have uh, quite a few committees and, um, you know, we have procurement and supply chain, regulatory affairs, which is the one I lead, and we have within regulatory affairs about 11 different subcommittees, um, environmental as well, we have provincial, uh, human resources, and then specific kind of sectors like digital health, lab medicine, etc. And these ones evolve based on our members' needs. We have um, over 180 members and growing, and really our members are all over the industry. It's not just manufacturers. We have importers, distributors, associations, consultants. Recently, we also added transportation. And again, the whole idea is that we understand healthcare in Canada and in our countries is not just the manufacturers. It's the whole healthcare ecosystem. So we want to make sure that we represent a holistic overview uh, of uh, our needs. So a little bit about MDSAP and the Kenyan Mentech industry. Uh, so as many of you may or may not know, Canada relies heavily on its importation of supply chain in order to supply our healthcare and medtech ecosystem. We do obviously have manufacturers on board, but recently I believe someone actually from Health Canada quoted that 70% of our healthcare products come from our neighbor to the south, USA, so thank you. Um, MDSAP plays a central role, not only where our Canadian manufacturers, as I've said, but also our importers, as they are limited to procure medical devices two to four that have MDSAP. So as you know, Canada is the only uh, country that has MDSAP as a requirement. We don't have Plan B. So a few lessons learned uh, during the COVID pandemic is, so we, we, we learned that, or we appreciated that there were new flexibilities such as interim orders that allowed us to bring in critical medical devices that were not manufactured under MDSAP. We also appreciate, and I believe Health Canada did mention in their presentation, that they are allowing these companies that wish to continue in Canada to transition into MDSAP, and they're giving them two years, and industry appreciates it, and I think it's a fair transition period. Um, and also, we have ongoing flexibilities uh, under uh, such processes like special access, as well as, well as exceptional importation, uh, because it does provide us opportunities to bring in critical devices in unique circumstances, such as shortages. Um, what we have witnessed and learned is that flexibilities outside of MDSAP are critical to implement and maintain in order to be able to quickly react to healthcare shortages or other emergency situations that may occur for various reasons. Um, global temporary flexibilities, what we're saying is global temporary flexibilities should be further studied and adopted into a sustainable long-term regulatory framework, such as mutual recognitions of quality systems, as well as mutual recognitions and reliance of regulatory reviews. Oh, just go back. No, where is it going? It has its own little thing. Okay, um, before I proceed on this slide, I actually jotted some things in regards to what I heard in the past couple of days that I thought it was very interesting, The kind of, it, it was a glimpse into some of the areas I'm gonna present. So um, I heard around concern around training of auditors brought forward from Australia in the first presentation yesterday, also talking about EU publishing registrar fees in Europe. Um, I heard about, um, um, needing to simplify and clarify auditing requirements. Uh, there was some discussion yesterday around misalignment around the dates to audit. Um, timelines concerns were brought up a few things. So some of the things I'm going to bring forward are not a surprise. Um, but then it was interesting to hear from other industry or registrars, regulators, and industry that we have similar concerns. So first, Okay, there we go. So just to let you know, as I said, our members are varied. We have it all over the place. So these are the members that responded to our survey. We had manufacturers, importers, distributors, and other, and other could be consultants that represent various manufacturers and importers. Some of the benefits they mentioned um, is that, first of all, the standard is obviously broadly recognized. Uh, it's recognized in the five participating countries and often accepted by other countries requiring, uh, requiring QMS certification. Great. 
it's also trusted. You know, when vendors have MDSOP, other people recognize it as a trusted, um, they get, get this, um, you know, kind of like a comfortable feeling that, you know, it's a good quality system. And there's an implied reduction in burden for industry, uh, reduced inspections, uh, one audit to cover multiple jurisdictions, knowing when the audit will occur. And I personally experienced when I was in industry is I could select my registrars and also I can interview my auditor because the most important thing is that the auditor needs to understand my product. Uh, if you get an auditor that doesn't understand a product, it's already challenging in itself. Some challenges we've had is, as you know, as I mentioned, it's only mandatory in Canada. Um, and so what that is causing us is that sometimes um, we're unable to progress in some business initiatives because of that. Um, it is the other thing that was brought forward is that it's a slow process. It's not only the process once the audit occurs, but also to implement. And, and it's a known thing, but you know, just it is lengthy to implement the quality system six to nine months. Uh, and the one thing that I found very interesting when I was in industry and as I moved into this association is this ongoing misinformation um, around the benefits of MDSAP and the cost of MDSAP. And I found myself actually speaking to someone from, I think it was from the UK that, um, you know, I just had opportunity to talk to. And I asked some key questions around, well, do you have ISO 1345? Yes. Do you already get audited by the FDA? Yes. So I told them you were like already more than halfway there into, you know, going to MDSAP. The difference is not as much as you think and the cost is not as much as you think. And he's like, oh, hold on, I wasn't aware of that. So I think one of the things that we're finding is that there is this misinformation and probably a legacy from when MDSAP was implemented. And I think one of the things is, probably talk about that later, is about changing that narrative or refreshing everybody's understanding of the benefits of MDSAP and really what it is they need to do. What's that gap? You know, people forget there's a gap analysis or gap audit before you proceed. So. Anyways, it's just one interesting fact. Small business lens, uh, you know, MDSAP is a major challenge for smaller manufacturers. It deters manufacturers from conducting business in Canada and therefore prevents Canadian access for innovative medical devices. Many innovators are smaller companies. Um, and obviously the first, they want to get a, a large return on their investment in the beginning and MDSAP is yet one more cost that they would, you know, we don't have a, a huge probably Canadian, um, you know, population versus other countries. And so that's a challenge for us in Canada. Uh, single audit program is not so single, uh, meaning that despite having MDSAP, our companies are experiencing regulators audits, uh, not for cause audits. And that's a challenge because then the whole story around, well, you're only going to be audited twice doesn't really pan out. Um, we also auditor, also the other challenge that we've been having is around auditor training. We've having, as I said, um, you know, industry experience is important for an auditor and our members are indicating they're having challenges both in regulatory knowledge of their auditors as well as industry knowledge of their auditors. Um, so those are two areas that are causing some challenges for our um, members. Um, so, we're talking about, um, you know, if, again, as I said, there's some correlation. So we're talking about days to audit. So we asked our members, have you found that different auditors or registrars audit you for a different amount of time for the same audit scope and type? And you can see that 38% said that there is a difference and 62% says that they don't see any difference. So that's an interesting uh, data analytics around that. Um, this one is a little bit, was a little bit more of uh, significant feedback and again as I mentioned it wasn't a surprise do you find a significant difference in the quality and knowledge of the auditor 67% of the members said yes and 33% said no and the question followed to that was if you had challenges then what was some of the example of poor knowledge of an auditor that have created an issue for you so they had a lack of specific knowledge about how regulations work while still being asked to audit against them. Um, so again, poor knowledge of the regulations they're auditing against. Um, auditors were not in tune with health care regulations and guidances, also performed their own interpretation, which caused some discussion. Um, and I guess one of the feedback was, this is especially seen in the area of post-market surveillance, and it could be linked to that a recent change in our post-market surveillance. So we're still seeing uh, legacy misunderstandings around the, the 
the last regulatory change in that area. Um, we have some situation where auditors are taking health care roles, such as interpretation of a device classification or comments on manufacturer's applications. And auditors don't pay attention to pre-market nuance around the participating country's regulation. So these are just a few examples that our members have brought forward uh, in this very, very anonymous survey. <laughs> Um, have you experienced one auditor would document an observation that should not have been written and 44% said yes, 56% said no. And what were the challenges? We can ask him what was the observation because I will need a longer survey for that. I just wanted to understand what does this challenge cause you. Uh, incremental unnecessary work, so they need to investigate and perform root cause analysis for a non-issue. Uh, they also had obviously resource challenges. We diverted from company pro uh, priorities to work on appeals. Uh, there was with that repetitive work. Um, so, um, challenging and lengthy appeals process as well, so the time and effort to resolve a non-conformance, found appeals process to be one-sided and not demonstrative of due diligence, and um, some companies had to escalate the issue to Health Canada. So, with that, I have some suggestions, <laughs> or we have some suggestions. Um, let me increase the playing field across countries, so we don't, we want some you know, some partners on this, you know, we don't want to be the only ones that is mandatory. <laughs> uh, alternatively, introduce exclusions for Canada and the comparable programs in place. Um, use MDSAP to further reduce ongoing FDA audits. Uh, you know, it was made clear to us in these situations that it's not a for-cause for audit, but it's based on specific codes that there is increased concerns for you know, valid reasons, but what the members indicated that they found that the actual audit was pretty much a duplication from MDSAP in many areas. So the question was, in those areas where there is duplication, maybe those ones can be looked at to be reduced. Um, and then increased participation of uh, other countries and we make uh, an attractive and will support bringing more medical devices into the Canadian market. And an interesting thing was I went to a RAPS conference in Montreal a few weeks ago and there was an interesting discussion around the EU MDR and the impact to industry and uh, industry uh, trade organizations in there had indicated that a few companies are planning to exit the EU or maybe not totally but certain product lines. Um, which and in turn we've also heard of an increase in MDSAP application. I don't know if the registrars have seen that, but you know that might be one of the causes. So with that and in this environment, uh, it will be a key time for us to maximize the, the benefits of MDSAP and its adoption throughout more countries. Uh, training. So I know we talked a, a little bit about increased training, but we have some more granular uh, recommendations. So we would suggest improved training and qualification initial and ongoing of auditors. Um, and one of the things that was interesting to me is we also have a yearly uh, regulatory and quality conference. Um, and we were very lucky to have some representation from Health Canada as well from the registrars. And we're talking about training in that conference and, and, and we may misunderstood, but the feedback we received that not all training is formal. Sometimes there's just uh, updates, information that are not, don't, don't require auditors to go through formal training and we think that that's where we might see some of these gaps. Uh, so we suggest all training be formalized with uh, a grading because the impact to industry is just significant even with small nuanced updates of information. Um, improve clarity, standardization, and consistency of methods of auditing by the auditors as method of training of all the auditors. Again, trying to standardize what we see as uh, something that's not so standard these days. Um, and assign qualified auditors and implement industry training. So it's another thing, is not just the regulations. When, and uh, speaking of someone from an industry, once you remove yourself from industry and become you know, something else like, you know, working at trade association or working as an auditor. After a while, you lose some of your knowledge in industry and industry keeps on moving and you haven't because you have now moved away from that. So it's important that we also maintain um, refreshed auditors around industry. It's a evol evolution. You know, we're talking about AI and machine learning. Um, you know, we have to make sure that we keep up to, uh, up to date with those. Um, and the other thing is, and, uh, the industry is suggesting that we implement a method for industry to evaluate our auditors on the job performance, meaning that after an audit takes place, industry would like to provide some feedback on their experience to the registrar, so then that can be used also to improve um, area 
does or identify any signals around gaps in, in knowledge. And we might see that, you know, again, as regulations change, we might see a wimpy a bit of a blip of a, of, of, a, of a challenge in that, and that helps with a quick course correct. Uh, and again, with all of the one and above is once we implement oh, hopefully all of those improvements, uh, then improve also the valuations of the registers in the areas of training services and auditing consistency, because again, that's what industry is seeking some more consistency. consistency. Service standards. Um, so implement service standards and cost recovery. I, I don't know about other countries, but in Canada, Health Canada publishes their service standards, and they do have a cost recovery when applications are, are you know, go beyond the service standards. Um, and so we're suggesting the same thing for registrars. Where, and by the way, this is very common in industry as well. I've reviewed and signed off on many contracts where there is a performance standard and cost recovery when the performance standard is not maintained. So again, partial refunds for industry cost recovery recovery as also it be part of the registrar's assessment during the evaluation of the um, by the regulators. And one other thing that I'm going to connect back to what you said around publishing of uh, fees, uh, we would like to see uh, registrar service standards be published as well because that's a key factor for industry to decide on a specific registrar around where they go with them. And it's not just the date to audit. Keep in mind that days to audit for a company is not only the cost of the actual audit, but it's the cost, the soft cost, the people that are intensely involved in these audits. It's very expensive. So even though a day might not seem significant, it is significant when a manufacturer is trying to produce product and all their quality people potentially and some of their production are off the floor. So that is significant. And again, in, in timelines, improve the standardization of how registrars calculate the number of audit dates because if it's the same scope and it's the same um, you know, type of audit, technically there should be the same number of audit days. So we need to just understand why is that happening and then maybe do a little bit of course correct in that as well. And increase connection with industry. You know, we love, we, I mean, I was so happy to be invited here to speak because I think this is key for us to be able to resolve some of these things uh, when they occur, as they occur, and really, you know, continue with this great work of MDSAP. Um, Canada is, uh, really appreciates the great collaborative work with Health Canada. We have dialogues with Health Canada. Actually, the next one is November 9th. And it's such an amazing experience to so just go and talk about issues and resolve them and really, you know, an ongoing, honest, and transparent discussion. So we definitely recommend this for just between the registrars, regulators, and industry. And then also sometimes it's just a one-on-one -on -one between industry and the regulators, and we have those already, and industry and the registrars. That's just an amazing opportunity. And then continue to do this yearly, um, you know, inviting industry because I think that's a great, uh, you know, just level setting and um, uh, it's great having coffee with some of you guys. <laughs> okay, and um, also the other thing that members uh, requested is improve and expedite appeals process as well. And some final thoughts. Um, the MDSAP program has proven value internationally and the increased adoption of, its, uh, of it across countries will improve also our global agility and reliance. We, all, we also believe that the MDSAP program should lead by example. It should be applied in a standard, consistent, and transparent way across countries, registrars, and industry. And industry is happy to support the standardization of the registrars by providing insight into industry's experience, as well as promote improve improvements by ongoing collaborative meetings and engagements. So we're here, we're willing to help, we're hoping to help, and uh, please continue inviting us to these types of meetings. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mia, for the presentations. Uh, any questions for Mia? Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, presentation. You know, it, it was great kind of hearing from your perspective from uh, a trade partner in the industry. I uh, just want to touch on two items uh, uh, you mentioned in your presentation. First, with um, you know, Health, Health Canada, you know, MD Sabs Administrative Program, we have FDA doing inspections at those sites as well. Um, I just want to kind of uh, uh, give an overview of a, a program that we have in FDA called the Risk-Based Work Plan. That's, ca that's kind of the old name. It's now called the Specific Product Risk Assignment. 
So that those are uh, you know targeted to very specific products, product family. You know, it's it's not you know uh, you know a, a firm. It's just the firms making for this product code. So typically, those are focused on device quality. So in, investigators go in with a, a narrow scope. So uh, if they find some threads, they could expand the scope to you know other areas that you might see that might become more like a routine inspection. So you know, there's nothing we can prevent that uh, you know, for those type of inspections. So that might be something that you're seeing you know, in, in Canada. And secondly, you touched upon you know, making it mandatory for other jurisdictions. As you know, the, the federal rulemaking is a very arduous and long process. So this is where we kind of rely on uh, industry, trade partners, you know, you have you know, more of influence, I guess, kind of outside of the federal rulemaking, you could speak to other folks, politicians, industry, right? So, you know, that's that's where we, you know, need your help if we want to pursue making this mandatory in other jurisdictions. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much. And I'm aligned with you. We, 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 it was interesting to learn about this other, you know, and I forgot the name you mentioned this uh, product, a car product specific kind of audit. And we're aligned with that. We, we acknowledge that it's necessary. It's just that we, some of the members that went through it saw a little bit of overlap with the MDSAP, which is what their feedback was. And if it can just maybe look into it before then, and, and to your point, if they see something while they're there, totally understand. Um, but yeah, if we can just analyze it a bit further, maybe there is potentially more areas that we can remove from that specific type of audit, if possible. Appreciate it. I think Danny right here, yes. <laughs> um, it's not so much a question, but I, I wanted to comment on one of your recommendations that you had about um, the registrars being assessed by the regulators and evaluated for like our timeliness. And I wanted to say, I mean, obviously from this week, it's pretty clear we all understand that there's improvement in this area that could be made. And assure you, I think every auditing organization can tell you that this is something that is looked at in depth at our assessments by the regulators. We're asked about KPIs. Um, how we're analyzing our own timelines and watching that, um, our you know, whether it's a resource issue, the root cause of if we do have timeline issues, what's the root cause of it, how are we correcting that problem. So it is certainly something that is um, looked at by the regulators. Yeah, and that's really appreciated. And I think that one of the things that's important, and that's why I really um, advocate for having these discussions, is because we don't we had so many lessons learned when we had that presentation in the regular affairs committee and there were things that we weren't even aware about and and having this conversation just industry knowing that there is something in place that helps change the discussion and say okay well there is something in place what can we do to help further so this is very important we're not saying the things aren't happening as we're not aware if they're happening and being aware that they're happening really helps industry not only make the conversation easier but really join in that effort A quick question on slide 17, if I just, I'm sorry, did I jump someone? I have a slide number. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, ba ba basically, the slide 17 um, said that you, there were some differences noted it I think, between auditors. I, yes. I forget what, exactly what the context was of that slide, but maybe you could elaborate. Comparing against what? Comparing against... Um, how CAMDCAST auditors performed or compared against between like inter-auditor um, correspondence from the same AO or what, what was that slide exactly hold on, referring let me, to? Let me go that one. <laughs> okay. It says, do you find a difference significantly in the quality? So um, auditors are cycled through. We sometimes will see UFD or the same auditor, and then sometimes we'll see a different auditor. So when you get a different auditor, obviously they have a different experience, but with that, we can then see if they under like, we'll see differences both in their industry knowledge as well as in their regulatory knowledge. So that's kind of what they're trying to, to evaluate is that for the same company, the same, you know, registrar, for example, could be where you see a different auditor. Do you see a significant difference within the quality between auditor and auditor? I hope I answered your question. And it could be, I didn't say specifically, um, 
well, they already mentioned that the challenge, the difference will be regulatory knowledge as well as industry knowledge. So it could be either or. I didn't go into much detail. However, I will say this. So Mentor Canada started implementing um, ongoing open surveys to our members so that, um, for example, when they have a pre-market issue, they will submit an issue. And then we actually, in the bilateral, we'll be talking to Health Canada about differences and, you know, timeline, scope creep and all these things. And so we're going to be doing the same thing for our members around on audits to keep on getting ongoing uh, as much real-time feedback to see when these issues uh, spike and what is the issue and have these open conversations. Again, signal detection is so important um, and, and to rapidly and hopefully easier to resolve it on a timely basis. And this, yeah, and I was going to say, in this case, when we do that survey, we'll expand that to provide more granular data. And we actually I really would appreciate registrars um, coming to Mentor Canada and say, can you ask your member these questions? I think our members would be more than happy to answer them for those ones. And again, these uh, surveys are 100% anonymous even to us. Um, my second question was slide 18. You, there was a comment at the bottom about um, pre-market nuance was not um, either understood or there was some comment on that and I, I'm i not sure of the context of what that question may have been. Um, was it between like classes of different devices or uh, I guess maybe if you could elaborate maybe if you know what the context was there. Yeah, this was a summary of all the responses. So I would have to go back within the survey and provide it to you, but I'm more than happy to do so um, at a later date. Because then they provided an expansion on the... Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Sebastian. Sano. Yes, I would like to, to comment uh, again on, uh, on the auditor training, right? So indeed, I think as a AO group, um, we discussed with the RAC to, to get support on getting more training on this because, of course, we relied on, on the audit approach. As uh, MDSAP auditors, we got the initial training, but sometimes, you know, to, to be knowledge of all the details or new updates, uh, sometimes it's not that easy. So therefore, um, we have recognized that and uh, I think uh, we are working to, to get this uh, more support from the RAs. And I mean, we started already uh, with the non-conformity. We just got uh, two weeks ago uh, very useful training from FDA on how to write non conformity because at the, at the end, the conflict with the manufacturer, that's the, uh, it's about non conformities, right? So therefore, this is already a big step. So now we will cascade uh, all this training within our organization and hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll get better. Of course, don't forget that besides the technical knowledge, we have the soft skill. And, you know, so therefore, I, I think there is a baseline we cannot avoid, yeah, of conflicts. <laughs> No, Thank you. And I agree with you. A couple of things. So I think there's a lot of discussions that happen between auditors and industry that will end up with not having a non-conformance because the auditor will have then understood it. We would like to try to minimize those as well because obviously, you know, audits, I have only met one person in my life and I will not name that loves being audited. Usually people don't. Uh, and so it's already people coming to this with a, a bit stress and whatnot and having to then go to a situation where they have to explain their work. It just causes unnecessary where you can just focus on the actual audit and probably audit more stuff. Um, in regards to auditor training industry, and we've again suggested to the regulator to Health Canada as well, industry will love to be part of that training. We can train what we do. We're the SMEs. Why don't you come to us? And I'm not going to say that everyone would let you open the doors and come let me train you on my stuff but there's a lot significant amount of industry members who would love to do that on an ongoing basis especially again as we're talking about AI machine learning those are going to be very painful areas to start in auditing and we really want to uh, reduce these as much as possible yes uh, totally agree that yes Improvement is always an opportunity to deliver a better job. Uh, if we go back in history, when the MDSAP started, uh, auditors, they were learning. And I would expect such responses back at that time because it was a new process. Now to hear that we are still having similar issues at 2023 makes me reflect a little bit. And what I'm aiming at 
يعني the audit time procedure was modified in the anti-SAP to accommodate Canadian manufacturers. So this goes back maybe 2018 or 19. So my point here, the reason was that Canadian manufacturers, they were not big size companies. So from our experience as AOs, when we are doing audits, when we compare the performance of a manufacturer of a small size company compared to a bigger size, we see there is a lack of competency and reliance in the regulatory understanding. So I do understand the point that when there is an auditor in a situation with a small size company trying to apply the anti-SAP regulations to them, they might find it that their interpretation is a little bit different. So the feedback, yes, we need to work on our auditors, but I also think that the industry themselves, they need to get support, maybe additional training themselves to better learn where they are trying to mar market their devices. Yeah, I, I fully align. I think training for industry is also a very important thing. I think just training. Everybody always, you never should never stop learning. And you actually now, I tell people when I started in regulatory, I had a chemistry degree. Now I need an IT degree. I mean, it's always changing. So we definitely have to, um, at all sides, maintain and actually speed up our training requirements because things are moving much faster than they did when I started, which I won't say how long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just want to kind of add on to Zaire's comment when it comes to time and the reduction for smaller companies and maybe explain a little bit why um, some auditing organizations might not even take that reduction because even if it's like I understand the reasons and but even a smaller company, you still need to audit the same number of tasks and you might have to audit the same number of regulations. So if it's all five countries. So it was very hard then when for our auditors when you now have taken that time away, but you still have to audit the same number of regulations and tasks. Yeah, for a long time. I think what, what I want to distinguish between industry saying you're taking too long to audit us, which there was some there, but also it's inconsistent the auditing time frame. I think the, the biggest thing is inconsistency. And we can then talk about your point, well, is it too much? That's, but I think if we can just solve the, the one point, I think we can all agree inconsistency, then we can, you know, look into the other part more. Um, and I think the survey was clear. We are comparing MDSAP to MDSAP. Yes. And not MDSAP to 1345. Correct. MDSAP to MDSAP, yes. So I would like to ask, when you say inconsistent, are you saying a half a day? Or are you talking like two days? It's a, it's a good question. As I mentioned, this one was just a really high level, but we are going to be implementing a more detailed survey. And I suggest all trade organizations do so as well. And we will be providing that granular questions. I love your question. I'm going to make sure, please, someone remind me to add that into the question. You're right, because just asking the question without getting detailed information might get you off on the wrong line, right? I, I don't think half a day really is industry's concern. I think when they say it's significantly different, it is different we're talking days, but I'm assuming. Because, I mean, from my opinion, that really shouldn't be happening. There shouldn't be a huge gap there. Yeah. We have an audit duration calculation worksheet, and we all use it as far as I know. Now, there are some, some people round up, some people round down, some add if there are um, many jurisdictions or a lot of um, critical devices, maybe the, yeah. the regulators or the, I mean, not the regulators, but the AOs will add a little bit of time. But they should basically, if it's strictly MedSAP, it should basically be the same amount of time. And I guess, pure assumption, but one of the questions I'll probably add to that survey, are you a multi-site or single site? Maybe the multi-site is what's causing the differentiation versus a single site, which is kind of like easier to. Maybe it has to do with the different distance between the multi-sites because there's travel time. Again, this is, we need to get more granular into this, what we want to do, um, and really give honest, tree, clear, transparent feedback so we can find the root cause or the 80-20 and focus on that 80. Thank you. 
standard, which is there's a standard of how organizations meet that standard was for them to determine based on what they do and how to do it. And I think that's probably what we all do as AOs, right? We mm-hmm. have uh, uh, responsibility to make sure that we have the time quoted uh, that meets uh, the uh, time mm-hmm. calculation. Um, but but there's never going to be uh, an idea that all those times are consistent. And I, again, I suggest that that's not really something that we should be forging mm. for. I would say uh, I understand what you're saying. I think that there's a difference between days to audit and cost to audit. Like, you know, I used to be a consultant. Um, I could charge $200, I can charge 100 Canadian, so US people, I was so cheap. Um, but, uh, um, but you know, that I totally align, people should price their own hourly rate, but we're talking about days to audit, and that's where the impact to industry happens, where it's people, not only hard costs, but the soft costs. I think that's important. And the other thing keeping in mind is once a company chooses an auditor, it's not like they're stuck with the auditor, but it's really hard to move away. And that's that's really a challenge as well for industry. So they might, you know, again, you have the surveillance audits and all that, so it's really hard for them to move from registrar to registrar. Um, and that might keep them in a situation where it is lengthier, but, you know, they're kind of, well, fine, you know, we're already with them, they understand our business. So I think that, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but I still believe that the time to audit should be as much as possible with some variability, the same, the cost to audit, your hourly fees is, you know, obviously that's business, right? So. Yeah, I would like also to add a point. Uh, uh, it's imp- maybe you can add to your survey when for the next round. Mm-hmm. Uh, are we uh, the responses are coming from a transfer like from an AO to AO or is it when there's a client trying to great question is it a client that that's trying to shop around Mm -hmm. so they come to me and they give me a piece of information and they see my days let's say five they go to BSI they see the days are four they're shopping they go to BSI now when they go to BSI as an example they find that they are outsourcing everything and then BSI says, well, you gave me an information based on this, I gave you four days. But now when I know how you are, you, as a legal manufacturer, your responsibilities, I cannot now rely on the four days and I have to audit your supplier. So now there's an impact, there's a change. Yeah. So maybe these two points in your survey might help us understand. Absolutely. Because as my colleagues stated, we are all using the same tool and the variability, variability is half a day, maybe one day. Yeah, so again, so to satisfy the market and they better understand. Great, great feedback and we will bring it back. And hopefully I, I know that one of, some people met to Canada are listening. So guys, jot it down, make sure I don't forget. Um, completely in line with that. I think also we have to keep in mind that in Canada, Handicast and ISO has been mandatory for many, many years. So this is not new knowledge. So I do trust, uh, you know, with those nuances, we have to absolutely clarify because maybe there is no issue, but, you know, really understand. I, I trust the knowledge because it's been, I'm not going to even date how long, but many years coming. So it's coming from a place of knowledge. But to your point, some things make total sense and, and we don't want to change those. Yeah. So everybody likes my survey? <laughs> yes, Bradley. Yeah. I have a comment um, related to the participating countries where you said that it's, it, you recommended it to be made mandatory, but is, it is implied in the program in the all or none rule. So in the event if the organization applies only for Canada and then in the initial questionnaire, when we start checking up the background of the, the organization, we find that the organization is selling in Australia, in Brazil, and they only sampled the country Canada. So the, in the initial certification cycle, we asked them to to add Australia, Brazil, and Canada, and not only choose Canada. Yes. So it is implied in the program that it is mandatory when they join the MDSA program. Yeah, yeah. I think really it's pro- these. This would occur when countries are already selling into other countries like US and other, other countries that already have their non MDSAB, and they're like, but we only want to. We also want to sell into Canada. And then they realize the cost just for Canada 
even that's what I'm saying. There's also around misinformation. They're like, oh, my God, the costs are high. I go, yeah, but then you don't have to be audited by all these other auditors and all your soft costs go away. And so there's also a lot of misinformation about the benefits. But sometimes that, you know, MDSAP initial costs, the hard costs are also significant, especially with innovators where and small companies. That's still sufficient for them to say, I'm going to keep on selling the US FDA because the population is large. I'm going to keep on selling all these countries. But I'm going to wait a little bit for Canada, and that's where that's where the Canadian only is a bit of a challenge. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions for Mia? Any more comments? Uh, thank you, Mia. Thank you. We will proceed for the ne next presentation. So, uh, Mr. Morocco from the Japanese industry, uh, please. Okay, thank you very much. An introduction for me, and uh, uh, my name is Naoki Moroka. I'm representing Japanese Industry Association Jira, and uh, also and uh, at first uh, I forgot. Sorry, I forgot the uh, explanation for the our industry association, association Jira. And uh, I would like to make uh, uh, some comment for that to explain the uh, Jira. And uh, Jira is a major industry association in, the, in, in Japan, uh, focus on the diagnostic imaging device, on the radio radiotherapy devices, and also IT devices. And uh, also Jira is a uh, founding member of the uh, DITA. DITA is a uh, global uh, international uh, trade association uh, recognized by the IMDRF, and I also and uh, be a board of member of the DIT. Uh, I would like to explain the, the today's presentation. Uh, I would like to explain the, uh, our our company case uh, as a Japanese expression. And at first, and I would like to introduce and my company situation. Uh, uh, our company, Shimazu Corporation, is the manufacturer diagnostic imaging devices at the scope of the uh, MT sub certification. In the category of the diagnostic imaging, there are several scopes of certification, such as ISO 9001, ISO 13485, or the other uh, regulatory certification, uh, for example, in the Japan or uh, EU MDD or EU MDR. In the case of the Shimazu Corporation, there are not worldwide huge company. However, in the, uh, we are not a small company. Uh, therefore, in the, uh, we. Uh, have to uh, we have uh, some exporting product therefore and uh, we uh, have to cover the MD sub uh, certification areas also the Shimazu have our company has a manufacture IBD instrument and IBD reagent at the, our headquarters and the group companies however the, the, uh, these sales uh, are not limited uh, are limited uh, and have not yet obtained the MD certificate. In our case, we have a uh, traditionally obtained product safety testing ISO 13485 certification and MDD certification from TUB Line and Group. And therefore, in the, in the case of the MD SAP, we choose the uh, Tsufrain and the group as uh, our AO, auditing organization. In this slide, uh, I would like to explain that we have taken the following steps in the scope of changing the, to MD SAP. Basically, the concept is the same as the changing the scope of certification. However, it was necessary to address the change in the auditing approach. In 
in the case of, uh, in most cases, changes in the scope of the certification are conducted as a changing audit, but the actual certification audit for the tradition to MD sub certification was conducted as a new audit. Uh, with that, uh, uh, AO does not have any uh, option uh, scope extension audit. And therefore, and we have to receive the audit as a new audit. In addition, uh, the 2016 and uh, 2019 period was also turning point of the subdivision standards and we had to consider the many points of changes at the same time. For example, MD sub pilot uh, was uh, uh, finished in uh, December uh, 2016. Also, ISO 9001, 2018 September, also Comiticas and uh, 2018 December. Also, ISO 1385, 2016 edition. It's uh, a transition time uh, was specified 1920, uh, uh, 2019 uh, February. Therefore, and we have to consider the, such a transition time. At first, then, uh, we introduced uh, uh, our product. Uh, we released the product not only in Japan, but also export to many other countries, including MD Saprak countries and uh, Europe or the other countries. And therefore, we needed to comply with the regulation of the each country. To achieve this, we needed to select a certification body that could cover the larger number of the requirement in the single audit. Yesterday, I think we discussing a uh, con combined audit. It's the uh, same things in the uh, current, current situation there. Yesterday, uh, we discussed a little bit combined audit was, and we have to consider the uh, concurrent audit differences in the certification cycle need to be uh, considered. I think uh, currently there are two types of the certification, three years and five years cycles. In the case of Japan, a QMS audit requirement will be applied to the marketing authorization holder, MAH, and the manufacturing site. Yesterday, uh, Japanese PMDA members explained the uh, Japanese uh, regulation uh, for the QMS inspection. In the case of Japan, QMS certification cycle is every five years. But the manufacturing site uh, can make a desktop audit if uh, MD SAP report, uh, if uh, they have a uh, MD SAP report. In such case, a uh, marketing authorization holder uh, could choose the desktop audit. They could ask a uh, PMDA or a recognized certain body carry out the desktop audit. I explained the uh, certification cycle, three years and uh, five years cycle. The first three lines and explain the uh, three years cycles. And the first one is ISO 138i. And the second is Comcast. And uh, uh, already in the, it, that the system moved to the MD sub schemes. And the third line is ISO 9001. Bottom line is uh, in the uh, 
uh, MD, uh, EU MDD or uh, Japanese PMDA Act. In the case of the MDD or uh, Japanese PMD Act, uh, they have uh, five year cycles. Therefore, in the manufacturer, I have to consider the, uh, such a manufacturing, uh, sorry, the, uh, certification cycles. Therefore, and, uh, we select and uh, carry out MD SAPS uh, audit and uh, uh, 2080 and uh, uh, 2080. And uh, therefore, and, uh, after that, we move on the MD sub schemes and uh, uh, for the uh, common class and also Japan selection. Another change in the audit methodology also needed to be noted. In the certification such as ISO 1345 or MDD schemes, it was regulated to the conduct audit on the organization by organization in each manufacturer's or manufacturing site. On the other hand, USFDA schemes uh, we have to uh, consider the uh, audit method based on the QCIT. We had to deal with both audit method uh, prior uh, introduced and MD SAP. After that, uh, uh, we introduced MD SAP. Uh, we are able to uh, satirize. Uh, centralized the uh, response by the integrated it the, into the MT SAP auditing model or, and uh, auditing approach. Uh, we think if it is based on the USFDA and uh, QCIT schemes. Uh, the, the other consideration and uh, normally if we introduce the uh, scope extension in such case, then we carry out a gap analysis uh, prior to changing the scope of the certification. But since we need already comply with the regulation each country, uh, therefore in the, we only responded to changes in the auditing approach. We think the benefit of the MD SAP, uh, as the benefit of the SAP schemes, uh, in our case, it has contributed significantly to the reduction of the regulatory audit by the USFDA or uh, Brazilian AMBISA, such as uh, regulatory audits. Typically, we think uh, we could reduce the, uh, such uh, auditing uh, by the USFDA or the Brazilian ambassador. We think uh, benefit of the MD SAP, basically each country's requirements are based on the ISO 13485 and there are no major differences. Therefore, in the audit results are now acceptable in the many countries, including MD sub countries. It's uh, uh, my conclusion for the, this presentation. Uh, we hope that MD SAP affiliated members will be expanded and further including their use in many countries.
Emily Sapp is a successful a success success story in the QMS field and the global harmonization activities. Therefore, and we look forward to the its further expansion. Meanwhile, at the IMDRF activities, Japanese Industry Association JIRA and also DIT continue to communicate their uh, expectation the, in the advancement in the single pre-market uh, single pre-market approval. We hope that single review of the medical device for QMS and the pre-market approval will move forward. We expect a uh, single review uh, to achieve the single review and QMS area also a uh, pre-market approval. However, in the a little bit difficult uh, pre-market approval yet, uh, therefore and, uh, uh, we would like to, uh, uh, MD sub update member will be expanded. That is uh, uh, our conclusion there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any questions for Mr. Morocca? So, Sebastiano. Um, I would like uh, to take as um, input what Morocco san said, and I have a question more for the um, regulatory authorities. So Morocco san um, talked about a single, let's say, pre-market uh, approval, which was uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is that, is there any plan for that? Because, you know, we have either 100% uh, regulatory approval uh, um, of uh, products, less uh, Health Canada or uh, US, or a hybrid approach like in Japan, where class two and some, uh, some of the class three are approved by RCBs, uh, others by PMDA. We have the U approach where everything is given to the notified body. So, say that is there any discussion ongoing to harmonize? also on product related approvals because i would say that on qms basis we are quite in a good standing with mdsap is a major program uh, very successful and uh, so therefore my question is uh, exactly this any plan for harmonized product approval Thank you, Christine. So, Rob. Hey, thank you. Yeah, um, just to let you know, on the IMDRF, there is a working group called the GRRP Working Group, which is working on documentation to for organisations to to review technical documentation 
So I think the long term aim is to actually produce a similar program for technical documentation reviews as for the MTSAP program. So if you go on to the INDRF website, you can see what progress has been made in terms of re reducing documentation in that area. And the long term aim, I think, is to produce the same similar program to MDSAP for technical documentation reviews. Thank you, Rob. Any, any more questions or comments? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Moroka. Okay, and thank you very much, yeah, Chair. And uh, I uh, would like to make a comment uh, to the MD SAPRAC members uh, because and, uh, uh, I explained uh, uh, in my presentation and uh, changing the uh, uh, requirement uh, for the ISO level. And in the case of the ISO 13485, uh, uh, ISO TC 210 will be start a systematic review uh, based on the ISO uh, directive. In the case of the ISO directive, you know, we have uh, ISO TC 210 or the other ISO groups uh, will be uh, reviewed uh, periodically, uh, mainly and uh, within within uh, five years or three years. And uh, therefore, in the IMDRFTC to uh, uh, ISO, uh, sorry, the ISO TC 210 will be start the uh, uh, systematic review for the ISO 1385. Uh, uh, they will uh, start the survey uh, for the systematic review. We will so soon. And therefore, and, uh, uh, please consider the uh, MD SAPRAC members uh, how to handle the uh, revision of the uh, ISO 1385. It's uh, my additional comment because and I'm also a member of the uh, ISO TC 210 WG1 uh, from Japanese industry. And therefore, I, would, I make a co this comment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Moroka. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mia. Yeah. Uh, so, the you mentioned reliance, and I just want to, it's not really for this group to do anything about, but it's just a signal that I think it's important that we should discuss. And I mentioned it to some of my, uh, those ones that I think I had coffee with. So, sorry for that. I had a spill with them. Um, so one of the things we're talking about reliance and I see great efforts. I was at IMDRF and RAPS and now here, it's such an amazing concrete effort that we're all doing to really do convergence and reliance and that's wonderful but industry also wants to bring up a big signal that fda health and all all of us are doing this but within our countries and our other regulatory um, divisions they are not and there we are seeing an alarming increase of regulatory um, requirements on medical devices outside of Health Canada, for example. And so I think it's important that we also keep that in mind and maybe do a little bit more of uh, explaining what we're trying to do to those other divisions, like the AI Act in Canada. We had, I'm gonna speak of Canada specifically, we have plastics labeling, PFAS, a lot of environmental things that are now doing a scope creep. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's important that while we're talking about our reliance, we also make sure that we communicate what we're trying to do outside so we don't end up with us being reliant, but then nobody else. We won't be any better off. So again, just, just a heads up that I think it's important that we should look at that as well. Thank you, Mia. Go ahead, Neil. Sorry. So, um... I was just reminded by our EU colleagues that we agreed during uh, the last management committee, uh, the closing meeting for IMDRF, that the next uh, workshop will be on Reliance in DC in March. So um, stay tuned. Hope to see you there. A uh, big plug for IMDRF 2024 in DC, second site to be de determined.
Thank you, Neil. Any more comments, questions? Okay, so um, as uh, the, the final of our forum is approaching, I would like to provide you some information about the attendance. So uh, this is the face-to-face -face attendance of this forum. Uh, we have here during this week uh, 76 attendees, uh, to, and, and then it was 24 official MDCEP members, uh, 24 also from the auditing organizations. We have 10 attendees from the industry, five affiliate members, uh, three observers, and two guests from Mexico. Okay. Regarding the remote attendance, uh, we have 478 uh, uh, attendees remotely. Uh, 340 of them were from industry. 20.5% uh, were also uh, guests, but most of them are also medical devices environment and some Brazilian marketing authorization holders. So also we have participating remotely some guests from different arrays, including Egypt, uh, Uruguay, uh, also some affiliate members as the Taiwan, FDA, and Argentina, and Israel. Uh, and then before we end the, the, the forum, I would like to open the mic for the Regulatory Authorities Council members of MDSAP. So we'll start with Australia. Is this working? Yes. Yep. Um, so I just want to uh, thank Anvisa for offering to host the forum. Um, it's been a, a very enjoyable uh, first trip to Brazil for myself. I've uh, really enjoyed seeing the, the culture and experiencing um, everything, including the very friendly people. So thank you. Um, so on behalf of the TGA, um, I guess Tracy and myself, um, I'd like to thank the attendees, those in the room and those online as well. Um, it's been some uh, very informative presentations. Um, and it's great seeing the faces I've seen before and also the new faces joining MDSAP. Uh, the program has come a long way since when I first started six years ago and that wasn't the start, um, but um, my first forum was in Canada and we had a, a much smaller room and that included industry and everybody in the one room. So <laughs> it's come a long way with more than 500 people participating in this meeting. Um, especially want to thank Anvisa for um, a very well organised. Um, you've gone to such an effort to put the forum together. It's been fantastic. Um, congratulate you on a very successful meeting um, and also uh, Thiago for um, hosting it and being a fantastic host and for organising the, the social events, um, which has been important in getting to know um, the other regulators and AOs and industry. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for your comments. So now it's supposed to be the Brazilian message, but we will break the, pro the alphabetic protocol today. So please, Canada.
grateful to be here today and, and through the week and learn from all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Christine. So our final Japanese message, please, please. Thank you, Ambisa colleagues, for hosting this forum. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation to the program. I think we have gotten very valuable inputs from all of you. And uh, on behalf of the LAC, uh, we would like to improve our process and uh, the program itself um, based on your opinions. Actually, the LAC is planning to have a meeting to review the outcome of the meeting of this forum. So then we believe that um, the program will be improved uh, through the output of this forum. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Kenichi. So, final message from our colleagues from FDA. Yeah, so so it seems our Envisa colleagues have set the bar very high when it comes to organizing Envisa forms. Uh, so you've shown us, you know, how it's done with such clear and expertise. So on behalf of the uh, FDA team, I want to express our he heartfelt gratitude uh, to our Envisa colleagues for their uh, warm hospitality and uh, hosting the uh, forum this year. Your dedication, hard work, and organizing this event has made it a tremendous success. Uh, we also want to extend our gratitude to the support staff, the IT staff, the folks around, you know, the servers, the workers. Uh, they're kind of the un unsung heroes that keep the ship moving. Um, we've been uh, truly touched by your generosity and the wonderful exper experience you provided. Uh, so we look forward to future collaborations with our, our AO partners, affiliate members, industry, uh, trade organizations and continue that partnership. So thank you very much. And I want to open it up to uh, uh, Neil or my fellow colleagues as well for additional comments. No, uh, same thing. Thank you so much for your hospitality. You guys are fantastic. Uh, best forum I've been a part of, and I plan most of them. Um, but uh, really appreciate all the hard work and dedication you have. You continue to show how important it is uh, this program is to your your organization as it is for ours. Thank you to our regulatory authority uh, RAC members uh, for your continued support as well. I think we have a lot to do and um, important work to do. Um, our observers and affiliates, thank you for being here as well. We hope that we can continue uh, to demonstrate how important this is and and how much of a benefit it is to have you on our um, on our team and hope you can progress in, in your your struggle to ensure I don't know if it's a struggle but um, just to protect your citizens and uh, we hope that we can be a part of that as well um, auditing organizations value your partnership uh, value your input um, we came out of well you've seen a lot of timelines this year and uh, I think multiple times but um, we started this journey back in 2012 with some of the auditing organizations very early. We've grown, um, went through a once in a hundred plus year public health crisis. I think we came out stronger. I hope we continue to develop and improve the program and we'll need your help there. So uh, we'll challenge you like you challenge us. Um, uh, industry, value your feedback. You're gonna hear that more often. Um, please let us know how um, we can improve our processes, make it least burdensome for us, for you, because it is important for us. Um, lastly, thanks to folks on the phone. Thank you so much for the 450 plus people that have uh, sat through this uh, um, uh, workshop and, and meeting remotely. Um, thank you for showing your interest in the program. Thank you for uh, your interest in um, uh, global harmonization and public health, and we hope to at least some of you see you in person soon uh, at another event, but please do not hesitate to reach out to us, um, any of the RAC members, um, if you have questions, uh, because we wanna make sure that uh, all, all the questions you have is addressed so that hopefully you can also expand your use of the program. But thank you all very much. Thank you, Invisa. So thank you, Neil. You already did part of my work.
<laughs> so thank you, uh, most of the attendees. So uh, Anvisa is really happy to have you all here. So uh, the, the hospitality is part of our cult culture here in Brazil. So I hope we can do another forum here in the future. And I hope you can come back here in Brazil soon for another discussions or even by vacation. So I have here a final message on behalf of Anvisa. Okay.